It's a rainy night in Speedway, Indiana, and we are standing outside the shell of the old Burger Chef restaurant. The town around us is lit up. Next door, there is a tobacco shop, which sees a steady stream of customers. Across the street, there is a busy shopping mall, full even at this hour, with people buying clothes and groceries. But the Burger Chef building is silent, dark, abandoned. It is a squat, one-story building with green trim, white walls streaked with splotches of dirt. The sign on the front has been blacked out. If you peer through the front windows, you can see that the inside has been gutted. Wires and fiberglass insulation hang limply from the ceiling. In 1978, when Burger Chef employees Jane Freet, Ruth Shelton, Danny Davis, and Mark Flemons spent the last night of their lives here, things would have looked very different. After closing, the glowing Burger Chef sign would have illuminated the parking lot. Against the bright lights inside, the four would have wiped down tables and mopped floors as they prepared their restaurant to reopen the next morning. There would have been activity at the shopping center across the street as well. A bomb exploded there weeks earlier, on September 1st. But that didn't keep people away for long. A popular underage nightclub thrummed with disco songs, even as the night grew later and later. At some time in the hour after the Burger Chef closed, on November 17, 1978, the four employees inside vanished, leaving the building standing as empty as it does now. They found the employees a couple of days later, dead in the woods. Two had been shot to death, one stabbed in the heart, and the fourth beaten and left choked to death on his own blood. It's one of the Midwest's most infamous crimes, and no one's ever been held to account for it, despite some promising leads. Like the red-headed witness who stood in the parking lot at the time the employees went missing, or the homeowner a short distance away from the burger chef, who found a loaded gun in his yard the next morning, or the violent rapist who twice confessed to the crime, or the robbery gang who targeted fast food restaurants. We're going to cover all those leads, and a lot more, on The Murder Sheet. This is You Never Can Forget, an investigation into the Burger Chef murders, a miniseries by the Murder Sheet Podcast. I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm a lawyer who represents the sister of victim Ruth Shelton. I've spent years researching this case and doing legwork to flush out new information and leads. And I'm Anya Kane. I wrote a feature story on this case for Business Insider earlier this year and never stopped investigating this case and looking for answers. On the murder sheet, we'll be taking a six-part look into this crime. After giving you a full overview of the events of 1978, we'll be presenting you with a new theory about what happened each week. On a weekly basis, you're going to hear from figures you've never heard from before. You're going to hear about facts that you've never heard before. And hopefully, you'll walk away with a better understanding of the sheer complexity of this awful crime. We don't just rely on what we've been told or what we've read. We have worked this case ourselves. Together, we've walked along sand-choked creeks, inside dark and decrepit hideaways, knocked on the doors of people who may have been involved in the crime, and talked with broken-hearted loved ones. We decided to do this podcast so we can tell you what we've learned and even clear up a few misconceptions. In this mini-series, You Never Can Forget, we will give you the top theories about the crime. 
After we're finished covering the Burger Chef case, the murder sheet will continue to investigate different restaurant-related homicides for the rest of season one. We're the murder sheet, and this is You Never Can Forget, The Night. The Burger Chef murders often sound a bit like a fast food ghost story. And like any long ago cold case, it's been the subject of a number of local myths. Let's start with one of the biggest falsehoods about the case. This is something we heard from a lot of people, including Jane's friend, Charlie. I think the police know who did it, but just can't maybe put the goods on him. Many law enforcement officials do believe they know who committed the murders. The problem there is the who. If you ask different detectives, they'll often name completely different suspects. Here's Jim Kramer, who worked the case for the Indiana State Police. If we were to go back, you ask about all these leads. If you go back and say, well, the Marion County Sheriff's Department thinks these people did it. Uh, Then if you go to the Johnson County Sheriff's Department, you can find somebody that says, oh, we think these people did it. If you go to the state police, you might find two or three leads that we think these people did it. Or the Indianapolis Police Department may say, well, these people did it. Not only is the claim that the police know who did it simply not true, it's actually harmful to the case. I think it's a disservice to the victims and their families. And I think it's a disservice to the public for law enforcement or for the media to kind of give people false hope that this thing's been solved because potential witnesses are out there who may have for years thought thought, or had a strong suspicion that their next door neighbor did it. And when the news report comes out that Donald Forrester did it, they say, well, I'm probably wrong. I'm not going to say anything. And, uh, you know, it, it it's unfair to the public. It's unfair to investigators who are working this. It's definitely unfair to the victims and their families. Um, but it only, conduct like that, only goes to embolden the culprits who did this crime or other crimes like it. When they sit there and the media is telling them, Donald Forrester did this. And the guy who guy or gal who did it or was involved in there sitting back saying, see, they don't know anything. It, it, it emboldens them, makes them comfortable. With that in mind, let's start by telling you what we do know. And let's begin by telling you a bit about the victims. Danny Davis was a quiet 16-year-old who started working at the Burger Chef shortly before the murders. He loved photography, even had his own dark room at home and he planned to join the Air Force. Jane Freet was the 20-year-old assistant manager of the restaurant. Here's her friend, Charlie. Ah, uh, Jane, she... <laughs> she was um, always laughing, always had a good good attitude. I, I just remember her braces when I first met her, and they just sparkled because she um, smiled so big. And um, Jane was kind of a... Homeboy, but yet very feminine and um, very hard to come by. She was she was beautiful and um, she loved a lot of people and they loved her. I have not one bad word for Jane. She, she was just one of a kind. I loved her. Mark Flemons was sixteen. Here's Ginger Anderson, who went to Speedway High School with Mark and worked with him at the Burger Chef. Oh, I thought he was. Um... Well, he was very nice and funny and, you know, joking around. He was always smiling and 
um, not sure, but he was in one of my classes. And that's when I first met him was when he first came to school. Um, uh, boy, he's uh, outnumbered as far as his race went. And back then, people were still pretty vocal about whether they liked black people or not. And for the most part, Speedway was all white. So I just wondered if he was going to have a tough, you know, tough go of it. Plus, you're a new kid anyway, and they always have a hard time starting school. Because I think it was in the middle of the school. It wasn't like the first day of school. And um, so I was nice to him and tried to talk to him just in class, just friendly. Hi, how you doing? And, you know, just hoping he'd be at ease and not so, not, not that he was nervous, but just, you know, trying to make him comfortable. So that's how I, it, how I first started talking to him. And then I got to know him better when he started working at Burger Shop. Ruth Shelton was 17. Here's her sister. Teresa Jeffries. But it was always neat to me because it seemed like whatever she decided to do, that's what she did. It's just a a employee, a city employee that was out there working on the telephone line. And it was in the alley behind our house. And she just went up to him and asked him for some wire. And he just clipped her off some and gave it to her. And so it had all the different colors in it. And then she'd just take them and twist them up and and turn them into rings, you know, use several different strands together so that we'd have like little flowers and different things. And I I remember I was in total amazement because, first of all, I hadn't even ever thought of doing something like that. And second of all, I would never have gone up to a stranger and just asked them, hey, will you give me something? But Ruth didn't hesitate from that at all. And she just always, I get, maybe it's just because that she she was five years older than me, but it was like she just knew how to do so many more things. On November 17th, 1978, the last afternoon of her life, Jane Freed, the assistant manager of the Speedway Burger Chef, went to visit her friend Charlie. When she came over uh, in the early afternoon, that she just wanted to sit on the couch and just hug and talk a little bit. And uh, I asked her, what's going on? Something bothering you? And she goes, no, I'm okay. Of course, Jane was that way. She she wouldn't want any help from anybody. And after it happened, I thought, well, maybe she came over to borrow money from me. Ginger had to deal with a bit of unexpected stress that afternoon. She usually worked at Burger Chef on Friday nights, but she wanted to go out on a date that night with a coworker named Brian. So she arranged for Mark Flemons to take her shift. And it's 4.30. So it's after school. And it's before my date with Brian. Brian was, was going to come over around 6 o'clock and pick me up. And Mark called me and said that something had come up and he could no longer cover my shift. So I was mad. Like, let me know. And he said, well, my grandma's coming over and there's a big family deal and I really need to be here. I said, well, okay, let me call Brian and I'll call you back. So I called Brian, told him the story. I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, it's up to you, but if you decide to go in and work, then I'll come in after we close the store and help you close the restaurant down so we'll get out earlier and then we can go do something. Well, no, I'm still 16 and I have a curfew and there's no way my dad's going to let me go out on a date starting at 11 or 11.30 at night. So this is not going to happen. So, of course, I really wanted to go out with him. So I said, no. I said, you know what? Mark said that he was going to work for me, and he's going to work for me. And this just wait it. So I called Mark back and told him that, and, and he went into work. Things were also a bit hectic at the Shelton household. I was already home from school, and Mom had come, gone and picked up 
Ruth from school, brought her home. She rushed through from the garage to back to her bedroom, and she just says hi and changed her clothes into her uniform and said bye. Jane's brother, Jimmy, took his young son Dutch to the burger shop early that evening. Dutch doesn't remember seeing Jane there, but he did see another one of the employees. Mark Flemons was practicing karate moves. And I just remember him kind of flailing his arms around or whatever, by the, by the fryers or whatever. Still worried about Jane, Charlie gave her a call during the middle of her shift. And I talked to her about eight that evening, and I'm um, probably at lunch, and I asked her how it was going, and um, <laughs> I hate to use these words, but um, she said, that's dead around here. And um, that's the last I heard from her. About this time, in the middle of their date, Ginger and Brian stopped by the restaurant and saw Mark there. Brian and I had stopped at the restaurant, and I'm going to say it was around 7.30 or 8 or something, I'm not for sure. And he was at the front counter, and he wouldn't talk to me, so he was acting all mad. I mean, he had a little smile on his face, but he was acting all, you know, eh, I'm not going to talk to you. So, okay, well, he's fine. But I really didn't, I wasn't concerned about it. I don't remember being, oh my gosh, she's so mad at me. I just remembered thinking, well, he'll be fine. He'll get over it. It'll be fine. So. Because he had a little smile to his face, but again, he wasn't talking to me. So I know he was he was um, I don't know, punishing me for making him go to work is what I thought. At 11 p.m., the burger chef closed. The restaurant shared a parking lot with a Dunkin' Donuts, and a member of the burger chef crew went there to get some snacks. It's possible that Jane got pizza for her crew to munch on as well. And there are reports that a receipt for pizza was later found on her body. This sort of thing wasn't unusual for Jane. There's, there were times where, um, you know, like we read where they she'd let us get pizzas or go next door and get Dunkin' Donuts or whatever to have when, after closing. At 11.15 or so, George Nichols, then a teenager, went to the Dunkin' Donuts to hang out with his girlfriend. That night, my girlfriend was working at Dunkin' Donuts. I used to go up there and uh, go out with her on a break. That night we uh, went behind the Dunkin' Donut. In between there and Burger Chef was a, a dumpster area. And uh, we went back there to smoke and drink a little bit. Well, I didn't have, we didn't have a light. Yeah, anyway, I walked in Burger Chef. And there was nobody really in there. There wasn't anybody. I waited and somebody came up there in front and I asked for a pack of matches. And the person went went in the back and then came back out and got me a pack, you know, gave me a pack of matches and I walked out. I just assumed or guess that they were cleaning up or doing something. But that was really the only person I seen. And Right before I'd gone in for the matches, I seen that they were, somebody was still there because the back door was cracked open a little bit. You could see the light um, on. And um, came back out and we started there smoking, drinking, and um, this, uh, these two guys, there's railroad tracks by now. And that's, these two guys walked down the railroad tracks towards us, and we, put our our drinks down and smoke and everything kind of stuff. They walked right up on us and the one uh um he looked at it, he said, You're gonna have to leave here and we kinda of looked at it. He said, There's been a lot of vandalism going on around here. And um, we got up and walked uh, back over to her, her job, and um, she went back to work, and I took off. The descriptions that George and his girlfriend gave the police of the men they saw that night became the basis for the widely circulated sketches of the suspects in this case. When Brian drove Ginger home from their date, they passed the burger chef. 
and it was about quarter till 12. And I noticed that Jane's car was gone, but the lights were still on inside the burger shop. So that, and you couldn't see, and I didn't see anybody, like somebody sleeping in the, you know, restaurant area or anything like that. So I was like, well, that's kind of odd. And Brian says, well, you want to stop and see what's going on? I said, I really can't because if I'm not home by midnight, I'll get killed. So, poor choice of words there. But anyway, um, I said, yeah, well, my dad will just have, have a towel. So he took me home and then he left there from my house and he went straight back to the house. And that's when he saw that the back door was open. Brian walked in the open back door of the burger chef. The restaurant was empty. There were coins from the cash registers on the floor. Jane and Ruth's purses were still there. Brian called a burger chef manager. At around 12.15 a.m., he rang the Speedway police. We talked with former members of the Speedway Police Department and other agencies, and they spoke of sloppy Speedway detectives and infighting between the officers and police chief Robert Copeland that predated the murders. We paid a visit to former Chief Bill Bergen, who succeeded Copeland after he was booted. Standing on his front step on a day so cold that his wife brought him a sweater as he spoke to us, he revealed the attitude that many Speedway law enforcement officers seemed to take on the case. They didn't feel up to tackling the horror of what had happened in their own community. I'm in, I was in the dark. I'm still in the dark, and I'm not searching for light. Well, I think it's pretty well known amongst law enforcement and the public. The Speedway Police Department did not do the victims any favors. They didn't do the public any favors. Uh, they didn't. They they didn't do anything. They mishandled this from the beginning. They took it lightly. They didn't follow what would be routine investigative practice. They um, went off on or uh, came up with a theory that these four kids took the money from the restaurant and just were out partying. Uh, they didn't take. Uh, they didn't do crime scene investigation. They didn't take prints. They didn't take pictures. So any evidence that was there was was lost. Charlie got the news of what happened in a 3 a.m. call from Jane's district manager. Around 4 a.m., police found Jane's missing car, sitting on a street just outside a town park. It was within sight of the police station. Jim Kramer heard an early report about the disappearances over his police radio. And Teresa woke up to a nightmare. Then the next morning, I got woke up by my brother, who told me to wake up that Ruth had been kidnapped. And I really didn't believe him. He was, he's two and a half years older than me. He was always picking and, and doing things to annoy me. So I just believed that was one of those things until I walked into the, into the family room area and, it was just an entirely different kind of day. You know, the phone was ringing and and mom and, and dad were both running to answer the phone. And at that time, you didn't have call waiting or two phone lines or anything. So you couldn't really stay on the phone with anyone if you had another call that you were expecting. So it was. It was just different. And then it wasn't long before, you know, family members started coming as well. Jim Kramer spent that Saturday trying to help. And I worked in the adjoining county to the west from the Burger Chef, just uh, oh, about three miles to the county where I was assigned. Uh, I spent my spare time through that shift uh, uh, hitting the back roads and the abandoned barns and areas where people uh, gathered to party, kids, stuff like that. 
Now, I'm not quite sure what I was looking for. I just thought, well, are these kids tied up out here somewhere? Did somebody, um, you know, somebody do something with them like that? The most interesting discovery that day might have come when a homeowner a few blocks from the burger chef discovered a loaded 38 in his front yard. We'll have more to say about that in the weeks ahead. And then on Sunday when I went to work, I drove over to the state police post of Putnamville, drop off paperwork and so forth. And when I went in, uh, it was, I don't know, 7, 8 o'clock in the evening when I went in, the uh, post commander just mentioned, he said, uh, do, you, do you hear about those kids from the Burger Chef, which I hadn't. And uh, I said, no, where'd they find them? They said, well, they killed them all. They found them down in Johnson County which uh, I always said you could have hit me with a brick would have been, uh, I was so shocked. I mean, it just, you know, that was kind of senseless. The four were found in a wooded area of Johnson County, about 20 miles south of the Speedway Burger Chef. Ruth and Danny were lying next to each other and had been shot to death. Jane had been stabbed in the heart with such force that the blade broke off inside of her. Mark had been beaten and knocked unconscious. He choked to death on his own blood. Now it was time for law enforcement officials to deliver the awful news to the four families. And I remember Sunday, um, just the same thing. We're watching the news and watching the news. My parents took us to church. Um, Everybody was praying for them. And... Then when we got home from evening worship was when that it was later that that they got the call from from the police and asking them to go to the station. And my parents left me and my brother back at the house um, and they went and I I knew when it when they left that she was gone because even even as an 11 year old child you've got some common sense if she had been alive even if she had been in a coma they would have called and said we have found your daughter she's alive and this is her condition. They would not have said, we just need you to come. And so I was already knew what to expect. But when she came back, when they came back home and told us, then there was no more hope. Not everyone was sympathetic. Already, rumors were beginning to spread that the four victims somehow brought their fate on themselves. And then there was a girl in one of my classes, you know, where they were all, it's, everywhere you go, in every class that I went in, there was, everybody was talking about it. The teachers allowed the kids. I mean, it was before counselors and all that kind of stuff. But so the teachers allowed the kids to say what they wanted to say. And I didn't say anything. Um, but... The teachers knew who I was, in fact, you know, knowing that I worked there and all that kind of stuff. And and there was this one girl that, you know, she made a comment that her mother said that really upset me that, well, you know, they they all deserve to die. I mean, if they're doing drugs and all that kind of stuff, and they got what they deserve. Charlie went to the service for Jane and saw her one last time. I'm sure she put up a fight. At the funeral, I saw her. Saw her left where it was busted up, and I'm sure she put up a fight. <laughs> her younger brother looked at me and said, This wouldn't have happened if you would have married her. Oh. Teresa will never forget her sister's funeral. She had that on. And it was obviously, you know, two of the hardest days of our lives. And the, the most absolute heart-wrenching moment was 
after everyone had left the night of the of the viewing when the, they closed that casket and I watched my mother drape her body over that casket and just fall. That image stuck with me forever. Could not imagine no one is ever supposed to bury their child. Next week on You Never Can Forget, the investigation begins. Uh, like I said, we were we started off with in a hole because we didn't have any evidence from the uh, restaurant. And the police uncover a witness who claimed he saw the whole thing, knew exactly who did it, and his life was in danger because of it. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet Presents You Never Can Forget. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Grainley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. To access exclusive content like bonus episodes and case documents, become a patron for the Murder Sheet on Patreon. Patron tiers start at just $3 a month, and you can find us at patreon.com slash murdersheet. Please send tips, ideas, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. And please stay tuned for word from our friend Nina at the podcast Already Gone, a great podcast you should be listening to. She actually introduced me to the Burger Chef case with her 2016 episode on the crime. Murder, missing persons, unsolved mysteries. Already Gone explores lesser known cases from Michigan and the Great Lakes region. I'm Nina Instead, the voice behind the Already Gone podcast. Join me for an in-depth look at stories that will have you looking over your shoulder and locking the doors at night. Find Already Gone on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or your favorite podcatcher.